hold, I, I can sit on this stool. <laughs> For a short guy, you can still see me, I hope. I, I also have to apologize, I have a little trouble speaking. I've developed Parkinson's disease. A big challenge for a million Americans like myself. But I, I, you, you may be more aware of this than I am. I'm going to give the, my talk to give a little historical perspective about the, the basic science departments at Johns Hopkins, the, the teams that formed the IBBS, because I've been uh, associated with them for 44 years. And I have to say, anything good that's happened in my scientific career has always been is either a part of the IBBS team or in the clinical departments across the street. It's a welcoming environment that allows people with maybe sometimes not the greatest credentials to make important observations. So I, I, I from Minnesota, I came to Hopkins as a medical student with the option, uh, the idea that I would get involved in world health issues. Global health was not a term that was widely used in 1970. But it was something I always wanted to do and actually had the great fortune as a medical student working on the problems of infectious diarrhea from the E. coli organism. At this time, cholera was sweeping the world, killing tens of thousands of infants and small children in Southeast Asia and South Asia. And it was clear that the traveler's diarrhea in the New World was probably related due to the toxin released from Escherichia coli, some strains of E. coli. And it was really that experience working in a laboratory in the pharmacology department that caused me to totally, totally change my career from wanting to be a WHO doc to being an investigator in the laboratory. And it was in a really exciting lab. It was run by a man named Pedro Fatracasas, who was a, a, a lightning-like investigator back in the 70s. He was the first to use affinity chromatography in biological systems. And they made important advances, the first isolation of the insulin receptor, the first isolation of the estrogen receptor. Well, my job was to isolate the toxin causing this horrible diarrheal disease. And I, I have to point out that working on diarrheal diseases doesn't necessarily enhance your social life. <laughs> I, I was at a mixer at Goucher College, a wonderful women's college, now co-ed, outside of Baltimore, met an attractive young lady. We were chatting. She asked me that faithful question. <laughs> Peter, what kind of medical specialty are you interested in? And, you know, I, I, I kind of thought, well, I should say neurosurgery or radiology. But I'm from Minnesota. I told her the truth. I said, I'm interested in diarrhea. <laughs> that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> but in truth, we were able to isolate the toxin. And, and it became no longer a mysterious malady, but a, a molecular disease, like now so many others. Well, this problem of fluid transport across epithelia, which is the basis of diarrheal disease, turns out to be to have been a long-standing problem in biology. So years later, we returned to Johns Hopkins after clinical training, and I, I was uh, invited by Tom Pollard, the chair of cell biology, a very important part of Eric's department, to spend a few years getting increased basic science training in preparation to become a, a hematologist in the Department of Medicine. Now, these may seem unrelated, but there's a common theme. And so we were working on red cells in the cell biology department, subsequently in the Department of Medicine, with strong ties in the basic sciences. We discovered a protein that showed up really unexpectedly. It didn't stain with the typical protein stains. We had an antibody that cross-reacted with it. So we knew there was something special there. And so we purified it. We determined sequence, which, which was made possible because of the techniques in the Department of Biological Chemistry one of the core IBBS labs run by Pete Peterson and his team. And the sequence showed an interesting homology with a series of genes from diverse organisms, organisms such, such as the lens of mammals, the brains of insects, a variety of tissues in plants. It appeared to be a channel-like protein, but we didn't have a clue what it was. And really, it was the discussions with the basic scientists caused me to team up with Bill Gugino in the Department of Physiology to test whether this new protein might be, as we expected, the first molecular water channel. So children learn about osmosis in school. They learn it at an early age. And we all understand that osmosis is when water will cross a semi-permeable membrane in the direction of a greater salt gradient. But how does osmosis actually work in tissues like 
choroid plexus of our brain or the lacrimal glands, the, the aqueous humor secretory part of the eye in the, in the airways to move water rapidly, extremely rapidly, and the answer was unknown. So it was really this experience in, in the IVBS with Bill Gugino that allowed us to test for the first time if this was a molecular water channel. And it's a very simple experiment. Sometimes the best ones are so simple. Frog eggs. Frogs lay eggs in freshwater ponds. They have very limited water permeability. If a frog egg was injected with a complementary RNA to express a water channel, it should become osmotically active. Pretty simple idea. And it worked. Six control oocytes transferred from culture medium to distilled water, nothing, 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 nothing. Six test oocytes, bang, 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 like popcorn. It was a, an amazing experience. And led to sort of a, a foot race, because if there's an aquaporin in red cells, red cells have water permeability, but the protein wasn't present in other tissues. For example, the collecting duct of kidney. We've all been on airliners with a full bladder and the seatbelt light goes on. <laughs> that final concentration of urine, it, it may not be earth-shakingly important, but it sure seems urgent at the time. <laughs> this is the Hummelach aquaporin II from the collecting ducts, the vasopressin regulated water channel, which will be an excellent target for drug development for the final cases of fluid overload that are recal rec recalcitrant to other therapies. Aquaporin 4 from brain. Turns out this is the entryway of water from vascular space in the brain into the brain parenchyma drink, brain edema. Again, another potential drug target. There are no good preventions for brain edema, and there are no good treatments for brain edema. We have friends in biotechnology who have made identified molecules which are specifically inhibiting aquaporin 4. It may also be important in diagnostics of the antibodies which cause a <coughs> malady known as neuromyelitis optica are specific for aquaporin 4 allows neuromyelitis optica which affects the optic tracts and spinal cord to be distinguished other, from other diseases similar like multiple sclerosis. Aquaporin 5 in secretory and salivary glands and then there are glycerol secretory permeated homologs which we call the aquaglyceroporins. Aquaglyceroporin 3 is present in skin and allows glycerol to hydrate our skin. This is now a topic of great interest in the beauty industry. I was invited to give a lecture in Paris by Christian Dior company. I, you know, I, I don't have a lot of interaction with Christian Dior. They had a new product which has some small molecules which lead to expression of aquaglyceroporin 3 in skin. And of course, they show this beautiful model coming out of a swimming pool. I have no idea if the compound works that effectively to me. <laughs> but who knows? Aquaglyceroporin 7 fat to allow glycerol to be released during starvation, aquaporin, glyceroporin 9 in liver. So it's a series of compounds. And it was, in fact, 10 years ago, as Steve mentioned, that I got a call from Sweden notifying me that I would share the Nobel Prize with Rod McKinnon from Rockefeller, who worked on potassium channels. And that was a pretty interesting time, frankly. The, uh, I ran, ran to the shower. My wife called my mother back in Minnesota. My mother's a farm girl and explained that I would share the Nobel Prize in chemistry. She thought for a moment, she said, Mary, tell Peter that's very nice, but don't let this go to his head. <laughs> <laughs> She's still expecting me to do something useful. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was 10 years ago tonight. This is our, December 10th. This is Nobel night. They're dancing in Sweden right now. That It was our turn. And I have to say, it was really because of the colleagues in the basic sciences that all of this story happened. And I think if it can happen in an obscure area for a hematologist who wasn't even looking for water channels, there are many discoveries that are not on the program that are waiting to be picked up. And I think we're going to hear about some two, two very exciting topics tonight from Sage and, and Erica. Thank you. Thank you.